we go. Okay, cool. Great, okay. Thanks everyone for, for coming tonight. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we'll have one or two more uh, come in as we, as we move along. So we're joined tonight by uh, Sabrina Moore from Antashka, uh, who is going to present a little on uh, the Clean Air Together initiative, which was run in Dublin last year, and which is uh, running in Cork literally right now. Uh, I'm one of the, the guinea pig households for, for this uh, initiative, which is about uh, gathering um, data on uh, particularly uh, traffic, uh, air pollution, and creating a map around the city. But I'll, I'll leave Sabrina uh, to the detail work on that. Uh, and then we're also joined by Owen McIntyre uh, from the uh, Centre for Law and Environment in UCC. Uh, and Owen is is going or is going to talk about just transition, uh, which, uh, as yeah, people can guess from our name, is very central to the uh, objective of this group. Um, and we ourselves have been wrestling with the concepts of a just transition and what it actually means um, beyond the abstract uh, and what it might mean on the ground. And uh, Owen is going to talk a little little bit about that. So what we'll do is we'll have. Um, I, I actually think these are two quite complementary, um, even though they're very diverse um, uh, talking points. So maybe it, we'll, we'll take the two uh, presentations together from uh, Sabrina first and then from Owen. Uh, and then when it comes to the discussion part, maybe we, we can use both to kind of reflect upon each other uh, and they might uh, complement each other in that way. Does that sound okay? That sounds great, yeah. Okay. Um, in that case, uh, I'll hand over to you, Sabrina. And okay. you we're saying that you have about 10 minutes of a presentation. Yeah, 10, yeah. 10 15, um, depending on your interests. Um, I'm just going to share a PowerPoint, so bear with me. Hmm. <laughs> Of course, it does look different from. <laughs> <laughs> Just bear with me. <laughs> no trouble. Uh, okay. Okay. I'm trying to show you the uh, just the presentation that the uh, presenter view. Okay, that should be it. Can you see the slides? Um, it's just an image at the moment. Perfect. Okay, great. Perfect. So um, yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me tonight. I, uh, I'm going to tell you about Clean Air Together in Cork, and I look forward to hearing more about your group as well um, um, after, I suppose, after my presentation. So uh, Clean Air Together uh, is a project that we ran in Dublin last year, and it's currently um, happening in Cork. And the purpose, as Oliver was mentioning, is to measure, to have citizens measuring air, air pollution from traffic by their door, more or less. Um, so the project is a collaboration between the EPA and Antashke. So here you see an image of an EPA air monitoring station, uh, state of the art, um, really expensive material. So using that kind of state-of-the-art monitoring station, the EPA would um, monitor different air pollutants, uh, some coming from traffic, some coming from solid fuel burning, some coming from the industry, etc., or farming even. Um, and among their responsibilities, they you know, have to report uh, some of this data to the EU, especially if there is a breach, a problem, if we're above a certain level. They have to um, then find a pathway uh, together with local authorities. And they also provide uh, and share the data openly with the public via their website, which is called airquality.ie. Uh, Lynn is one of the engineers there. And uh, in terms of Antashka, um, we have a, a large engagement and team. Uh, so maybe you've you're familiar with some of those programs. Um, I'm just going to point to a few, but green schools, if you're a parent, probably your kids are attending um, a green school. <laughs> They're working towards being a sustainable school. Um, green campus, that's the same thing for uh, third level. 
uh, climate ambassador, uh, blue flag clean coast. Um, hopefully you've come across some of those. Uh, so a few years back, I um, with support, you know, financial support and expertise from the EPA, I launched a, a program in Ireland called Globe. So that's one of those logos. And the purpose is citizen science um, on all aspects of environmental or of the environment. So you can think about air, water, um, biosphere, a soil, uh, etc. And the program was relaunched um, with schools, uh, primary and secondary, on a national basis. And one, I suppose, of the area that the EPA was curious about was air and involving students in monitoring air pollution from traffic by their school gates. So, so we're we're still running that campaign a few years after, and it's it's very popular. We have um, nearly two hundred schools taking part nationally in in that campaign. Um, but I guess following on from that, and because of its success, we felt that we could use some of the things we had developed um, uh, in order to run a similar campaign with, ad with adults this time and, and create an awareness campaign. So that's cleaner together. Um, so yeah, citizen science is a concept that is quite trendy. And the idea is that, um, yes, we're doing science. So the data we're collecting, it's meaningful. Um, it's quite robust, uh, it's indicative. It's not as detailed as what the EPA would get with their um, fancy monitoring stations, uh, but still scientifically uh, speaking, it's robust. So uh, the EPA will be using that data uh, in order to check their uh, model of air pollution in Ireland. So uh, a model is a mathematical formula that helps the EPA bridge the gap between the areas where they're monitoring air pollution and in the areas where they're not. And in order to create a model, you use input data, such as like traffic data and weather data, uh, but also historical air pollution measurements and clean air together. Data will be used to check, uh, especially in Dublin and Cork, whether the model is accurate or not. So even though we're only collecting data for a month over a month in Cork, because of the very localized data we're going to get, it's going to be useful to the EPA. Um, and it's also a citizen project because um, it's not the EPA doing it. They could be doing it. They could either with local authorities and just be deploying. You're, you're going to see what the instrument looks like, but it's a tube, tubes around the city. You know, it would be completely feasible. But the whole point is to get people active, get a stake in it, and. Uh, hopefully be more interested and, uh, and open to dis discussing the theme of air pollution. And in, in our case, it's mobility, really. Um, so yeah, there, there are pictures that people posted on social media, uh, people taking part in Clean Air Together Cork. And on some of them, you can see the tube I'm talking about. So it's, it's quite small. It's very light, um, the size of a lipstick. and it's very simple. Uh, it's, a, it's called a passive sampler. So it is sampling the air continuously for uh, the time of the measurement, which is four weeks. And the, uh, there is a mesh inside that gray cap that you see at the top. Um, it's continuously being influenced by the air in the tube. And uh, an expert lab at the end of the measurement period will analyze that mesh and let us know what the concentration of a particular pollutant was on average over the period of measurement. Um, so yeah, so the whole, one of the reasons why we're using something so simple, like it's literally stuck to a window and left there for four weeks, is that we want uh, as many people as possible to take part and uh, we want it to be accessible. And Oliver, you can, you, you, you'll give us your feedback. <laughs> um, so uh, in terms of scale uh, for Cork, that's a map of Cork. Uh, it's not very zoomed in, but just to give you an idea, um, the purpose was to have tubes in different areas of Cork City Council, the, the kind of geographical area of Cork City Council. Uh, all the people, like there are people who signed up here were included, which was great, uh, apart from just a few that were outside of the area of study and you can't even see them there. Um, 
and that's about 900 people. Um, among them, there were slightly more women, 53%, which is great because it's not necessarily the case in citizen science projects. Um, we had a good representation in terms of age groups, so people between 25 and, and 65 uh, applied, and it, it is quite, you know, um, it's a good distribution among that age group. Now, if you're a bit picky, there were less of the young adults, so 18 to 24, and less of the 65 plus. And it's probably a feature of the way we are recruiting people <laughs> and not tapping into very young people, social media and, uh, and other ways to access um, people over 65. Uh, that being said, there is a big bias in our participants and it happened in Dublin as well. Um, it's the level of education that participants have. They, uh, just to give you one or two, two data points, 46% um, of people have a postgraduate degree um, and then 75% would have a third level degree. So that's quite a high attainment. Um, we did do some you know, outreach and use different groups to try and get the word spread in the community. And I think that worked to some extent, but it's not changing the overall picture. Uh, people with higher levels of education tend to sign up. And yeah, that's very common in citizen science programs, unfortunately. So in terms of the air pollutants in Ireland, like the, the main two uh, that have health impacts for humans, so they're considered of concern, um, are NO2. So that's the one we're measuring with Clean Air together. It's also called nitrogen dioxide, and it's created by um, diesel and petrol cars, especially older diesel vehicles and heavy vehicles, they would produce more NO2, more modern cars would produce less. And so my own car is pretty bad. Um, the uh, other pollutant is particulate matter. It can be created through NO2, like in chemistry, things are not, <laughs> things are dynamic, so NO2 can become a particle itself. It's never that simple, but the main source of particles in Ireland, it's the burning of solid fuel. So that's um, a, pollution, a pollution we see more in the winter uh, on cold nights. And it, it's worse on still nights because the air doesn't dilute when it's windy. Uh, the pollution moves away and dilutes. Well, so we can have those very, very polluted nights uh, in Ireland in the winter. Um, this uh, pollutant we're not measuring through Clean Air Together, our tube, as cool as it is, <laughs> doesn't have the cap capacity to do that. Um, but we can talk about this more in the Q&A. This is something of interest. Uh, in any case, so both air pollutants have health impacts. So actually, all, <laughs> all pollutants do. They're not good for us. But we have to recognize that they impact some, some people's health more than other people. Uh, so the, the people the most impacted by air pollution are very young people, uh, the very young, the very old, people who have a pre-existing condition, especially a respiratory or cardiovascular uh, condition, and people with lower socioeconomic status. So that last point, um, I, uh, I got from a, a study by the EEA, um, it's the Environment European Agency, and they did 2018 encompassing different uh, pollutants and other themes like heat waves, et cetera, looking at the impact on different segments of society. Um, so, you know, at an at a, at a EU level, that's true. Uh, there were a few studies from Ireland that showcased that um, uh, we see that, that impact as well. The reason being, uh, you know, at a high level, and we would need to have, we think, a specific study for Ireland if it hasn't been done yet, um, being that maybe in that segment, people have, you know, on, on, on average, uh, overall uh, worth, worth uh, health, and then they might be more exposed because of where they live, uh, they're, they live closer to a busy road or where they work. Um, so just something to bear in mind. I, I know it's important to, to you and to, to us all. 
Um, so the impacts of air pollution, they I, I suppose they can, you know, for anyone, even someone healthy, they can inflame your airways and uh, and aggravate, um, you know, your your your, your well-being, etc. But for people, um, uh, for more serious, I suppose, um, in more serious cases, they make um, your um, sorry. Um, yeah, no, they have a range of impact, but like it's respiratory and cardiovascular for the most part. But you pro you've probably seen a lot of studies. There are more and more studies showing different impacts in young people, like on IQ. Their the range of impacts can be very, very large. So um, this is a map of Dublin. Um, so I'm showing you the results for Dublin. Uh, apologies for the cartoon image. We have an actual map, but it's not on the website at the moment because we're running Clean Air Together Cork, but it will be back when we have the results for Cork. But it was just to give you an idea. So those were a thousand people who took measurements in Dublin. And um, in terms of scale, so there are NO2 levels in microgram per cubic meters. Uh, you see the red, um, it's 40 plus, so that's an annual average. And the reason it, why it's red is that the EU uh, considers that a limit as an annual average. If you're above that, you have to report to them. It's a breach and you have to put a plan in place. And that in the past was, um, you know, um, there was an area in, in, in Dublin near Houston Station that had such a, a reading. We were in breach um, uh, for NO2. Um, and then when you look at the scale, so on the uh, opposite, end of the scale, 0 to 10, that's the lowest level. And then as you move up, um, you change colors. Um, but I suppose at a glance, looking at the map, you can see a big difference between the center of the city, um, which is in orange and yellow, and some of the major roads, like the M50, and then the outskirts, the outer suburbs and the hills, and uh, some of the seaside locations, they're much more in blue. So, I mean, that's that's reflected here. Most of our measurements were uh, in the 10 to 20, the light blue, but they were typically found in the suburbs away from big roads, like an estate, uh, a housing estate here. Uh, whereas in the center and close to national and regional roads, we had much higher readings. And finally, what I was showing you, like in much less dense areas. So yeah, there's it's it's well known. There's a direct link between NO2 and proximity to traffic. It doesn't travel very far, NO2. Um, although, as you can see here, there is nearly a minimum level. Like in Dublin, when you go to the hills, it's it's dropping. But there is a it's kind of the baseline level. So um, in terms of looking at those results, it's always a bit tricky because. On the one hand, you have the EU limit of, of 40, and that's what is legally binding. And, you know, Ireland, generally speaking, is doing quite well. We had one breach, but, you know, the vast majority of our monitoring stations, they would be well below that, as you imagine, just looking at Dublin. Um, but it's become trickier because um, a year ago, in September 2021, the World Health Organization, the WHO, they made a recommendation based on the latest health um, science, I guess, the impact of air pollution on health, uh, human health. And their recommendation dropped from 40 to 0 to 10. So um, that's what they want the countries to, to reach, you know, to ensure that people are in good health. So, uh, of course, to take into account the struggle that a lot of countries, including European countries like France or Germany, or not in Italy may have like, um, but there are many more countries in the world. But anyway, they're um, they're looking at interim targets. But the really what where they want us to be is that zero to ten. So if you go back to that map, really it doesn't tell the same story. If you're looking at the EU, you're like ah, it's grand. Um, if you're looking at the WHO, you're like yeah. Uh, I suppose the majority of locations are not are not up to scratch. So um, yeah, um, that's, that can be uh, discussed further. But um, I think it's important to note. Um, in terms of the, uh, I suppose where Ireland Ireland is still following the EU limit, um, the EPA has called for the WHO limits to be 
adopted, but it would it would pose a problem because the vast majority of our monitoring stations, not vast majority, but the majority around the country would be in breach for NO2 and 4 p.m. So it changes the picture from Ireland is generally good air to something else. Um, and yeah, so that's it. A, we're, as Oliver said, we're, we just finished the measurement period for Cork. So the tubes are being returned by participants and we're going to share the results uh, in February. I know it sounds like a, a long time ago, but um, the lab needs time to analyze the tubes and then we need a little bit of time to put things together. So we'll share the data. It will be open source. Um, available to anyone and um and that's it for me yeah thanks sabrina and um i i know that there's there's a huge interest in in, in knowing what the results are going to be um i mean e even there was an interest in and you were very good to provide it to to the members of cork city council uh the, the map of that you showed in, in your presentation mm -hmm. of of where they are because there was an appetite even for that knowledge you know sure. um, such as the the interest um now i i did say that i would go to to own next but maybe just at this point um if, if there's any specific questions for, for sabrina about the running off the the um the clean air together initiative i just have i suppose one or two uh if that's okay uh first you mentioned like today is the return date um and when i when i took mine out and put it in an envelope i was wondering you know how many people remember even today is day a couple of months ago and, and <laughs> gotta remember today um so we're like what what was the return rate like in dublin and what are you expecting in cork um mm -hmm. and, and then the other question that, that popped out for me uh just in in your presentation is just you know without going into kind of the broader topics maybe that that, that owen might, might be touching on um how did the area around houston station uh, you know, addresses breaches, or do you, do you know that? So uh, to start with Cork, um, we're, we're trying to remind the participants in different matters, so sending emails uh, through social media, and uh, that's pretty much it. So <laughs> uh, we start emailing people directly, you know, after a while, if we see there is a drag, but they're, yeah, it's citizen science, so it's not 100% done, and it's not 100% perfect. Uh, so we we do see issues with the tubes as well, uh, especially in Cork more than Dublin. I don't know if it's the weather, but a, a few, you know, a good few of them fail and, you know, the results won't be valid. So, but that's that's the messiness of citizen science. And it's, you know, it's it can be hard for people to understand and frustrating, but it's it's fine. Yeah. It's part of the game. Um, I just on, on that point, before getting onto, onto Houston, maybe I, I, I noticed that and maybe it was the big downpour we had last Sunday week. <laughs> Uh, that yeah mine, mine got a, a battering <laughs> yeah oh yeah there were storms there were like all sorts of weather um yeah um we're we're going to try and and make it sturdier the next time but it's it can't be perfect uh, in terms of yeah the return rate i think it was around 80 percent which is quite you know it's quite good um my feeling is that because of we had with tubes being falling down, I think it's going to be lower in Cork, but we'll see. Um, and then your other question, sorry, was around, oh yes, Houston, the breach. Well, uh, so the EPA had to write a report to the EU uh, together with, uh, and Dublin City Council had to make, put a plan together to explain how they're going to solve the issue. So, um, I think it was a pretty long plan, like a few hundred pages, <laughs> and it does include, you know, um, uh, investment infrastructure that is done at national level, all sorts of things, plus modeling that show that the older cars that are going to be taken off the road, the older buses, etc. And then all of that included, we hope that this will happen going forward. Okay. okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay, th I see, see there's two hands. Um, so I, I'll, Alan first, um, and, and, and then Owen. Thanks, Oliver. Thanks very much, Sabrina. Um, I suppose I have two questions, I suppose, really. The first one is just, I was wondering um, about the cost of the programme, because mm -hmm. in Cork County Council, I was asking, or we have been asking for more air monitoring, more 
air quality monitoring stations and we're told you know these proper stations that the EPA have the stationary ones the permanent ones like they can be I mean 10,000 euro or whatever for every different sensor you want whether it's particulate matter or NOx or SOx or ozone whatever mm. and then cost to the station itself another 20, 10 20,000 euro whatever they could be almost like 100,000 euros so they've been saying there's no room in the budget and things like that so I was just wondering it's, it sounds like a really great um, project you know how, how much did it cost to get this this data which is really valuable so that's my first question mm -hmm. and my second question I was just wondering if we've had the assessment and we have the data and we have these results which show as you say like that by WHO recommendations we were way in excess in many places probably in Ireland of the recommended limits I mean and even where EU law I suppose applies we're probably in excess in a lot of places as well I just wonder what do you think going forward once we finished assessing and we know what the sources are where the problem areas are you know how could we enforce change how do you foresee that happening if a government is really willing to tackle the sources of the problem what, how do you foresee that we would tackle this problem basically I yeah, it's a million but dollar question <laughs> yeah yeah i'm just yeah if thanks you very much a million? no i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> well it's you know in the in the case of n2 it's it's transport so it's how we how we move around and it's a very complex issue in ireland because we know we're we're having all, all modes of transport sharing the road infrastructure pretty much apart from pedestrians so we're sharing the same space and how do we make that space work for more modes of transport, cleaner modes of transport and, you know, not everyone is equal again, like uh, for everyone. So, yeah, it's linked to um, when you think of Cork and Dublin, like city planning, but it's, it's way beyond that. Um, NO2 is more an urban issue. So, you know, when you think of NO2, think of uh, go away, Limerick, yeah, <laughs> Dublin, Cork, and um, you know a few a few bigger places. But I, I wouldn't worry about other areas. Not like CO two, where <laughs> if you take your car, you take your car, you're you're emitting CO two. Like NO two, you're emitting it, but no one is breathing it. Um, if you are outside of those bigger urban areas, um, PM is <sighs> very tricky and. You know, especially this winter, it's the burning of solid fuel. Um, we have an energy crisis. What will be the behavior of people uh, with regards to heating their homes this winter? Will they use more solid fuels and what type? Uh, some are cleaner than others. You, you, you can find the information on, on the EPA website, but uh, not burning is the best option. Um, but for many different reasons, historic, like the gas network and cultural, it's quite important to burn <laughs> around Christmas time. And, you know, so, um, but that creates huge air pollution, even in, you know, you can be in a smaller town or out in Wicklow and have like really, really high levels uh, outside. So I can't imagine what it is inside for people, what they're breathing. So again, it's very linked to your topic, you know, just transition. How do we make sure people are warm and they're safe? Um, and how do we move to cleaner energy? Uh, in terms of the breach of the EU limit, it's quite rare in Ireland. Like that's why we have that image of like a clean, <laughs> clean country, which we are, you know, compared to, um, again, I cited like France, Germany, uh, in terms of NO2, or you could think of London and PM. There's a lot of PM in Northern Italy and, Eastern Europe, um, a lot of burning for different reasons. So uh, we're, you know, we're among the clean, cleaner countries, but we know that air pollution <laughs> has an impact even at lower levels. So that's what the WHO is telling us. Sorry if I missed any of your questions. I probably have, but um... I was just wondering about the cost, I suppose. Oh yes, the cost, well. yeah. of course. So in terms of the tube itself, it's it's around fifteen euro. Um, and then you have to add the cost of logistics that would add between five and 10 euro uh, because we send the tube and then people send it back and then we send it to the UK for analysis. The, the lab is based in the UK. They're, they're the only one that offer that service in, in Europe. Um, so yeah, you could say just to make it simple, 30 euro a tube all included. Of course, there were other costs associated, like for example, you know, my salary 
we had a bit of IT developed for the project that was done internally by the EPA, a website. So you, you'd have to add those things, but at least that infrastructure can be reused for similar projects or even projects on other, you know, water quality, whatever. Um, so it's it's there. Um, yeah, so hopefully that helps. So it's it's much lower cost, but you need you need someone to manage that. It does take a bit of time. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. No problem. No problem. Sounds pretty question. Uh, Owen, and and then after this question, we'll we'll go to you, Owen, for for your your presentation. Thanks, Oliver. Um, very very brief question, uh, Sabrina. Uh, forgive me if I missed this during the presentation. Uh, in your results in Dublin, did they correspond very closely with EPA figures and EPA uh, monitoring? Or was there any discrepancy? So, um, yeah, so I, I wouldn't know the exact number, but I think the EPA at the time would have had around 30 air monitoring stations. So um, there we had a thousand localized spots. They're, at the moment, they're using the data to compare to their models. And I unfortunately, I can't really tell you yet, but in the final report we'll be publishing that will be uh, made transparent whether the data helped. Um, um, when they were looking at the data, like, you know, from a very, at a very high level, they were not very surprised. But now the, the devil is in the details. So that's why we're doing this. So, so the key contribution is that it's, much more detailed, uh, much, much more detailed, detailed. yes, very granular. And that's where we want to go. Like uh, EPA wants to produce very detailed maps so that they're meaningful to people, not like generally the air quality is good today. Like what is it on your street? And um, it's their ambition to do that in the next two years. Uh, so to have near real time air pollution information, very detailed as well as the three-day forecasts. And that's why we're doing a study like this. Uh, really, I mean, really useful for local communities that want to lobby local authorities about traffic patterns and <laughs> traffic direction and things like that. I mean, you know, traffic counting. I can imagine it's, it's going to be really, really, really useful and, and you know, uh, looked at very carefully, particularly by communities that are, are addressing traffic. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thanks very much for asking me, and thanks Owen too for your question. And it, it segues actually into how I was thinking your your, your two talks are are linked, um, because I mean when 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 you were talking, Sabrina, you know that there's an obvious social dimension to it, but you were about the participation of women, participation participation of people, um, based on educational status, how it affects older people, young people, people with underlying health conditions, uh, the burning of fossil fuel. I, I'm thinking myself how that is related to, to socioeconomic context. Um, and you mentioned too about you know how um, people from, from lower economic status were participating less, but I, uh, I'm pulling now what, what you said in the, um, in the committee meeting to, to Cork City Council about how you, know, you yourself noticed that there was a relationship between places where where uh, people of, of lower economic status tend to live um, and um, the, the the pollution you noticed so I I, I know you're speaking on, on, on a just transition uh, Owen which is a different topic but at the same time I I can see relationships like this but I'll hand over to you for the next part oh, thank you Oliver and uh, I should apologize that um... I didn't re actually realize today's uh, meeting was on was on uh, questions of air quality and air pollution. I carelessly um, read your email and I saw the just transition greens and for whatever reason, I jumped and, and made sort of, you know, added two and two and got 29 and uh, thought you wanted me to talk about just transition, but maybe it will work, but forgive me for that. And in fact, I would have loved to have maybe prepared something to follow up uh, on your presentation, Sabrina, because I run a, a postgraduate and LLM, a specialist LLM program at UCC, and we have a clinical module. And a couple of years ago, we had a very uh, interesting and very successful clinical project with the Asthma Society of Ireland, where we prepared a legal briefing for ASI to lobby for what are now the current um, uh, uh, smoky solid fuel restrictions coming in this month or coming in, uh, I think the end of this month, they're, they're due to kick in. So we we were involved in that and it was really fascinating. And in fact, as I as I saw 
uh, you explain this project, I thought what we would have done with this research at the time um, would have been really, really, really useful. And so I can see how in that kind of a context, it would be really valuable research to have, you know, and, and to that level of granularity and to be able to tie it in residential areas quite clearly to, you know, uh, residential burning of smoky fuels and things is, is, is hugely interesting. But in my uh, carelessness and my, my uh, misunderstanding of the brief, I uh, thought I'd prepare a quick uh, discussion on just transition. And as a lawyer, we're increasingly confronted with this paradigm of the requirements of a just transition, the, the objective of a just transition. It's finding its way increasingly into legislation, not yet in this country, but international, into a lot of international policy documents. And as a lawyer, of course, our first reaction is, well, fine, but what does that mean? You know what I mean? Do we, do we know exactly what that means? Do we have any clarity? And as one goes into it, unfortunately, you know, we don't. And I think it's, it's important to try and you know, construct a reality around the just transition, to think about what this means and what it would mean for policymakers, for those involved in formulating and drafting legislation, in creating rules and in enforcing those rules. So I'm going to share a very brief, um, if I may, uh, presentation with you, which I have here. Um, I hope that's going to work. Maybe not. One second. Let me just. Uh... Sorry, I seem to be doing something a little bit wrong there. Oh, there's the button. Is that working? That's perfect. Okay. And uh, so just very, very briefly, this notion of ident identifying core legal elements of a just transition. Uh, if I can move that forward. Ah, okay. Now, I know these look like very dense slides, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through them really quickly. Um, the origins of, of a just transition, we can trace it back as early as the 1980s from uh, global federations of trade unions, um, uh, you know, and it was associated with this kind of the prospect of a transition from, from solid fuels, primary, from fossil fuels, primarily concerned with, with providing support for affected communities. And of course, because it was trade unions, primarily concerned with employment and, and with labor. And uh, so, you know, tended to be associated with these uh, uh, elements like retraining and skills development of affected uh, communities, affected workforces really, pension bridging rights, uh, social security and health, um, revised unemployment insurance schemes, preferential hiring rules for people who were displaced or whose, whose uh, jobs disappeared, uh, freedom of association and collective bargaining rules for affected workers, labor mobility and occupational health and safety law. So really very much a labor law and employment law type of paradigm. And then the, 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 the mission really was to see, and what the unions were concerned with was to see if this, you know, we could integrate this labor law concern or employment law concern into the sort of complex that makes up climate change law. You know, and that complex is indeed complex, you know, environmental rules, regarding you know things like emission targets uh, energy law like carbon tax and renewable energy uh, targets land use and uh, planning law for example regarding the siting of renewable energy projects which of course is one of the major problems in siting uh, renewable energy in this country um, property law impacts increasingly immigration law aspects indigenous law in countries where that's relevant and trying to incorporate labor law somewhere into that complex and give it a place within that complex. The problem I would suggest is that we need a broader conception of just transition that goes beyond employment impacts of decarbonization. So if we think about, I think climate adaptation is massively important. I mean, you know, we're likely to see massive and disruptive infrastructure projects around, around um, uh, climate adaptation. So, you know, that's going to have all kinds of impacts way beyond uh, the, the employment relationship. Uh, think about climate smart agriculture that might impact, you know, uh, might result in increased costs of food, et cetera. Who's going to be impacted by that? How do we provide uh, safety nets? Uh, building retrofits, equitable access to energy efficiency. We see all of these problems in Ireland today, you know, where 
uh, the cost of, of, of retrofitting houses will not be met by grants, so you need a lot of money to get into it. You're waiting to reclaim money. Um, climate adaptation, for example, in Cork, one of the biggest uh, uh, environmental controversies locally here is flood protection around the Lee. Um, the the uh, price of food, of course. Uh, and then even in relation to, to carbon taxes, you know, how do you impose carbon taxes on, on energy use while ensuring equitable and secure access to energy for all segments of the community? These are problems that we are, we're already, we're already seeing. Um, we see the just transition finding its way more and more into sort of the international policy context. And just to pick one instrument, um, the, the uh, ILO guide, we see it, it's also linked to uh, the human rights and climate change nexus, you know, where uh, climate change has become very, very closely associated in, in, in international sort of policy and international law with human rights issues. And we see that linkage being made. But if we take a, a 2015 set of guidelines by the International Labour Organization, now of course it is, you know, the International Labour Organization, it's likely to be focused a lot on, on labour issues. Um, they set down a number of you know, things like a strong social consensus regarding goals and pathways, requiring social dialogue, ongoing stakeholder consultation, things that we haven't always been very good at in this country, actually. Um, you know, uh, to respect, promote and realise fundamental right to work, again, more concerned with labour, uh, to take into account a strong gender dimension of many environmental challenges and opportunities that goes well beyond labour um, and looks at, at, at a transition much more broadly. Uh, mutually coherent, here's the sort of the, the, the nub of it, mutually coherent economic, environmental, social and labour policies to encourage enterprises, workers, investors, consumers, etc. to embrace transition. That sounds easy, you know, that's a lovely ask, but, uh, you know, how do we bring that about? And I'll come to that in a second. Uh, to promote the creation of decent jobs, anticipating, you know, employment impacts, so, you know, social protection changes, skills development in a range of areas. And then also, you know, a, a no one size fits all, which you have to have regard to specific local conditions. Very, very important in terms of, particularly in terms of things like adaptation, look at the stage of development, look at various economic sectors and their importance. And then to foster international cooperation. Again, easier said than done if we're looking at the deployment of competitive, of, of technologies that impact on the competitiveness of an economy. So, Way beyond these uh, ILO guidelines, we're starting to see it you know, fit into declarations from the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the conferences of the parties, the COP2018, COP24 and 2018, the Silesia Declaration on Solidarity and Just Transition, that notion of solidarity that uh, communities and countries with state actors, with you know, technology, with resources should assist those without. Uh, again, in COP25, here looking specifically at labour in 2019, Climate Action for Jobs initiative. But other bodies, the C40 initiative, our coalition, which represents over 100 mayors of, of world cities, of 100, over 100 world cities, this uh, uh, policy around this agenda around the green and just recovery. We see it increasingly being pressure being put on multilateral development banks, World Bank, IFC, European Investment Bank, and all the regional investment banks you know, increased pressure to update their environmental and social safeguards to take account of, of, to broaden the social aspect of their environmental and social safeguards to make sure that, they, that they, they, uh, the green transition they invest in, and they are becoming major players in the green transition, that they, they you know, take on board the parameters for a just transition. Um, so what does it mean to a lawyer? Do we have an analytical framework? And we don't really as yet formally, but you know, looking at the literature, and I think for any lawyer, it becomes very obvious very quickly what this would have to look like. That, you know, we have to have these sort of interdisciplinary and inter-issue methodologies providing analytical frameworks for assessing, identifying and assessing equity. What is equity or what is fairness? Lawyers don't like the word justice. We don't like the word fairness. We prefer to use the word equity, you know, just because justice is a, is a very difficult concept to get a handle on. Philosophers like it, political scientists like it, lawyers tend to stay away from it. Um, but there seems to be three concerns, environmental justice or environmental equity, climate justice and energy justice. Now they overlap a great deal, but if we take those three sectoral issues and then three different types of fairness, right? Three different types. First one, distributive equity. 
the sharing of costs and benefits, making sure that burdens fall fairly on different communities, depending on their ability uh, to shoulder those burdens, that resources go to communities depending on their need. And you know, this notion of distributive equity, if we look at it in terms of environmental justice, you have to consider things like proximity to infrastructure uh, and the, the effects of that, distribution of exposure to environmental risk, uh, the environmental impact of renewables. And we're not just talking solar and wind. Are we talking nuclear here? I suspect we probably are. Um, climate justice then, you know, a fair distribution of exposure to climate risks, so to flooding, to other types of, of um, heat waves and, and, and everything else. Uh, a fair distribution of the costs of adaptation. Um, a fair way of, of compensating for or facilitating displacement of particular activities and what the, the cost is likely to be by displacement of activities, agricultural uh, and other activities to particular communities and uh, how to sort of offset those costs. And then secondly, all right, sorry, in energy justice, you know, all of this while ensuring affordable energy access um, you know, identifying vulnerability, identifying risk of fuel poverty, um, and also exposure to harm from, from new forms of energy, for example, you know, uh, the extent to which we consider nuclear as a, as a, a, a decarbonizing uh, option. Uh, procedural equity, then, is something we're probably further down the line in developing procedural equity. You know, this notion of broad and meaningful access to information, participation in decision making, and access to justice. So environmental uh, procedural justice, that question of that notion of meaningful participation. We have the Aarhus framework uh, in Europe. We have the new Escazú uh, framework in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean modeled on the Aarhus Convention. And uh, so those principles are reasonably highly developed, continually evolving. We have infrastructure, we have things like the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee, a lot of, of legal jurisprudence on that. And that's really, really important because that you know, paradigm of participation builds community resilience. It's really, really important in terms of community resilience, in terms of the kinds of, of, of changes that communities are going to have to uh, endure. Uh, climate justice then in the procedural sense, again, we're talking about public participation, you know, meaningful participation in climate mitigation and adaptation strategies. So really, you know, innovative, clever, responsive, meaningful uh, processes and procedures for engaging with all aspects of the community in, in what are likely to be you know, really profound changes in societal changes. And then, of course, procedural uh, energy justice. So community involvement in relation to, for example, renewable energy development, uh, location, generation. So things like you know, community generation projects, so community ownership of generation projects. We really have to look at how that can work and how it can be made to work. I don't think we, we engage with this seriously at all. There are models, we do see examples of where it's worked and worked quite well, but we really have to work. The procedural aspect also makes these changes much more palatable to communities, much more acceptable. And then probably the most difficult is restorative justice, this notion of, of righting past wrongs. So in terms of environmental justice, we're really talking about remediation of environmental damage, present and historical and compensation for losses uh, relating to such environmental damage. Um, in terms of climate justice, historical reparations, uh, reparations maybe for the costs of adaptation, where we know that certain communities who you know, maybe are, are amongst the least, we see this on a global scale, but also a local scale, communities that you know, may have, have, have be the least responsible for our contribution to climate change, bearing you know, the, the lion's share of the cost, coastal communities, for example. Um, the problem of climate displacement uh, and how we, we, we manage that equitably. Uh, and when I talk about restoration, not only restoration for you know, previous environmental harms and displacement, but community and social restoration again. You know, the sort of the, the where communities are disrupted, making sure that those communities can develop cohesively and coherently. And we do have methodologies around that. We've seen when large scale disruption of communities through large scale projects like hydro projects and in different parts of the world, it can be done. You know, communities can be can be sensitively relocated and such like. Um, and again, the very difficult question of responsibility and liability in relation to to impacts, which is which is problematic at every level. Um, and then energy justice, you know, access to you know uh, renewable uh, energies and renewable technology to low carbon technologies 
ensuring access to affordable energy for all sectors of the community and all, all types of communities. And that again is very easy to say. You know, for example, in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in, in uh, Kyoto, in Paris, we have all this guff in these legal instruments about, uh, you know, technology transfer and access to technologies. And these are commitments made by states. But of course, the technology doesn't belong to states. The technology belongs to private corporations and private actors. And the idea that they're going to share these, you know, with, you know, uh, game-changing technologies at, at cost or at a loss or something is fanciful. So we can make these commitments, but they're very, very difficult to deliver. Um, and then just finally, you know, what is this going to mean in practice? You know, what are we going to have to have in terms of, you know, uh, redeveloping our legal frameworks, our policy frameworks, and, and, and the strategies for developing legal and policy frameworks? Um, it's pretty clear, you know, Coherent and integrated policy frameworks, integrating environmental, economic, climate, social, labor policies, etc., and principally the inclusion of, of, of a, a broad social dimension in climate and, and environmental policy. How do you do that? Well, intensive intersectoral communication between different sectors, between transport and agriculture, and you know, urban planning and energy and labor and everything else. Uh, Intensive intersectoral communication and coordination at policy making level. Again, that's easy to say, but you know, in, in our own history of, 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 of government and almost everywhere in the world, this is really, really, really difficult. Ministries compete rather than, than you know collaborate. Um, robust and inclusive planning framework for infrastructure development, sophisticated as, uh, environment assessment methodologies, both at the strategic level, you know, strategic environment assessment and at project levels. So really robust, you know, uh, methodologies that take account of, of long-term social impacts as well as environmental and physical impacts, you know, that really, and those methodologies do, at least nascent methodologies do exist, but we'd have to take them a great deal more seriously and tailor them to, to individual uh, contexts. Robust procedures for intensive public and stakeholder participation at both the strategic and project levels. And then frameworks for effective restoration, both environmental and social uh, and community restoration in relation to impact mitigation and compensation. Now, that's easy to say. Uh, all of these things you think, well, that should be something that we can build into a whole sort of policy framework and policy making framework. But if we look at, 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 at uh, our, our performance to date, it's very, very, very difficult to do this. I mean, we use this term integration, and I would use the example of, of environmental integration in EU law. We've had a legal uh, obligation to integrate environmental uh, requirements into other areas of policy at the EU level, written into the founding treaties for over 40 years, and it does not work. You know, it really has no legal heft. It's co commonly ignored and, 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 uh, and disregarded, uh, despite its, you know, ostensible legal character and binding nature. It's very, very, very difficult. So this intersectoral coordination is complex, it's time consuming, it's expensive, and it's difficult, both substantively, procedurally, and institutionally. And policymakers will say that the problem is urgent, we have to move forward, and these you know, notions of integration get, get, get uh, sidelined or dispensed with entirely. You know, decision makers prefer a single set of legal or policy objectives. Um, a, a Dutch lawyer, a very, very uh, uh, eminent uh, European environmental lawyer, looked at this in, in, the, in the context of environmental integration, and he called it the minestrone effect, uh, a guy called Jan Jans. And what he basically says is you get minestrone soon, and you could leave out the celery, or you might leave out the mushrooms, or you might leave out the beans, and nobody even misses it, you know, because there's, it's, it's that, there's that much in it. It's that complex. You don't really need absolutely everything for this to be recognizably and, you know, acceptably minestrone soup. And he says, we end up with this problem, trying to put too many things into a framework, trying to ensure that all of these things are, are, to have, are, 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 are considered and included and taken account of, means that really nothing is, is taken account of adequately. And I think it's a major, major problem. It's going to require really careful thought, you know, rather than simply repeating a mantra of just transition and the need to integrate, et cetera. We have to think very, very, very carefully how we do it. And as a lawyer, not just how we do it, 
how we enforce it, how we ensure that communities can judicially review, challenge, object, uh, where they feel that certain interests haven't been uh, catered to. Sorry, I was much longer than that. Excuse me. No, and, and you had, had no reason to apologize either to start. It was it, it was um, an incredible um, uh, presentation to hear. And thank you very much for it. Um, I, 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 there was so many thoughts going through my mind when I was, I was listening to it. Um, I, I, I'll try and repeat some of them here. And if, if other people have, have thoughts too, please put up your hand. First of all, um, you, you, know, you, you touched on some of the things which, which locally uh, are linked to, to just transition. You, you talked about flooding in Cork, retrofitting mm -hmm. schemes, carbon tax. I can think of other ones too. Um, mm -hmm. I like bus connects. Uh, here in, in, in Cork City is linked to the perception that some communities are taking yeah. on cost transition you know, more than others through the loss of their streetscape. I've heard uh, electric vehicles be, being talked about in this in this way, um, that the perception of some people are locked out because of the cost. Uh, you, you mentioned the cost of living crisis and the energy crisis. That's another one where people you know talk about energy being a scarce resource uh, or, or and seeing it um, as being you know, unfairly distributed. Um, so two questions and, and and they're probably very close for, for you um kind of coming from that uh so one i i've heard conflicting uh views on how the word just transition should be used uh, mm -hmm. some people think that it's being overused um and so it's losing its meaning uh from a, another perception um you know the the rigid view of it being you know you, you described it, you know it's, it's history as a term and, and that that rigid view it, it no longer stands and, and we need to open it out um but where is the balance between between it being all things to all people uh, at all times and and it being something firm um and the second question and it's it's probably very related to, to in particular the, the, the end of your, your presentation so a just transition wasn't defined in, in the climate act um, and that was something that was contested at, at the time. Um, was it right or wrong, in your opinion? There, there is reference, you know, to a just transition involving two simple things: one, maximizing employment opportunity. I, 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 I wonder what's meant by maximizing employment um, and the underlying concepts of that. Uh, but also the, the second one to support uh, persons and community or communities who are negatively affected. So it, it's linked at least to those concepts, but it's not defined or is that enough in your view? Sorry. Uh, there's sort of two aspects, I think, to, to the question. If I boil it down, there's, there's really two. First one is very easy. The idea of, you know, uh, the definition of a just transition in the Climate Act. I think it's a damn good thing it's not defined in the Climate Act, because I think if we defined it in legislation, we could look back and, you know, repent at leisure. Uh, it's always a mistake to define something within legislation before you thoroughly understand it, or before you've had a a really good opportunity to think about what this means because once something gets included in legislation, it gets baked in. You know what I mean? We we end up with a with a with a, an idea of what that means. We end up with jurisprudence around it. We end up with sort of it frames the debate thereafter. An example I would give you of that is that in the Habitats Directive, the sort of the, the this big flagship piece of of uh, uh, hugely ambitious. Uh, instrument, legislative instrument at the EU level was adopted in 1992. And, you know, we hear about it in, in, in the Irish courts every week, practically. You know what I mean? That we have a, a major issue going to the courts or being referred out to the European courts on the basis of the Habitats Directive. Hugely, hugely important paradigm. And at the very heart of that measure is what's called appropriate assessment, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, this, this uh, uh, requirement for a detailed assessment of the biodiversity impacts, if you like, habitats and species impacts of projects or plans. And the, the ultimate sort of outcome of that test is that you can only go ahead with a planning permission or an environmental license or anything else if you can you know, satisfy yourself beyond reasonable doubt that the project or the plan will not adversely impact the um, integrity of the, the protected site having regard to its conservation objectives. And that notion of integrity is nowhere defined in the legislation. So integrity is the core substantive standard of protection provided, and nowhere is it defined. And I often would have students say, it's remarkable that that was never defined. And why should that you know, come before the courts 30 years later trying to find out what that means? If we had defined it in 1992, it would be laughable. 
it would have curtailed the ambition of this instrument entirely. We wouldn't have had a really fully formed idea of what integrity might mean in terms of the protection of ecosystems and the protection of species. We wouldn't have had regard to you know, interconnectedness and a whole range of ideas. So to keep it fluid, to keep it something that can be defined as we go forward, or at least to, you know, if, if you include it in the legislation, for God's sake, don't define it. You know, have an sometimes, I mean, most things you will want them to find, but sometimes it's likely to be a moving, you know, and developing and evolving concept. And be very, very careful about how you do that. But, you know, going back from that a little bit, I would say that one of the first things we should do in relation to, as part of the overall climate issue, you know, with, with in, in the context of citizens' assembly and everything else, you know, to the extent that we're trying to open up a national. I hate the term, but a national conversation, if you like, a national discourse on climate, really uh, a just transition should really ought to be part of that. And what we need to do is not define it, not, you know, uh, uh, definitively understand, because I don't think that's really feasible. But what we should do is, as a, as a community, as a country, as a, as a polity, we should identify what we consider to be the key priorities within that just transition. You can't make it everything, you know what I mean? You've got that ministry only problem. So let's say what we are concerned. What are the impacts going to be in Ireland? Are they going to be employment? I don't think employment is going to be the major issue. It's easy to point to a couple of, you know, peat-fired power station in the, stations in the Midlands, but they themselves were an aberration, you know what I mean? They were a, 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 an, employ, an artificial employment creating uh, uh, project, if you like, in an employment black, black spot in the country and during a time of, of energy and security. They were never really feasible. They were never really part of the real economy. Is, is, is job losses likely to be the big uh, threat now? I don't think so. I think our, our challenge in terms of just transition is likely to be rather different. And it's likely to be dealing with um, uh, things like like uh, climate adaptation, I think that's likely to be a much, much bigger challenge. Um, but we have to have that conversation as a country, an informed conversation with different communities, different sectors, uh, civil society, industry, different different sectors of industry, you know, people who work in relation to natural resources, fishermen, uh, fishers, you know, uh, agriculture. And, and what is our priority? How are we going to identify that? Try and look down the road and, I, and, and think, what are the immediate, what can we see right now? And it's never a definitive list, but what can we see right now as being the likely impacts of our chosen route? Do we have an idea what our route is to go and move towards renewable energy, et cetera, of our chosen route towards meeting our commitments? What are the likely impacts of that going to be? We're getting a clearer and clearer picture of what the, the actual physical uh, and environmental impacts of climate are going to be. Who's going to be affected by that? And how do we choose to address it? I, I'm not aware of that conversation taking place in this group on any of that. Thank you. I, 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 I'm pleased anybody who wants to put your hand up, please do. Um, so I, from that, two, two other ones. Thanks, Alan. Uh, two other ones, if, if, if I could ask you, um, and, and I don't expect you to have the answers to these, um, but you're, you're right, in, I think, in, and I agree with you, in, in that you know, energy production uh, what was identified as, as being, you know, just the core just transition in Ireland. Um, I, agriculture was looked over. Yes. And I think it, it's only now that, that farmers are realizing that transition and just transition is, is it matters to them. It's, it's Absolutely. interesting. Absolutely. Um, and and I, I, I wonder if you've thoughts on, on, on how you communicate that to, to certain, uh, you know, sectors of society that, you know, not all, not only does does climate change affect you, uh, but also the you know the transition affects you, and and there is a space within within yeah. the discussion for you. Um, and then the other one, uh, I, I'd like to ask you for your thoughts on maybe it's 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 a very similar thing um, about intergenerational justice, um, and and how how <laughs> I'm really going to put you on the spot on this one. How 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 can that be framed in law? <laughs> you know how, how can the in, inaction of one one generation you know, yeah. be restored for, for a later generation uh, two very nice questions thank you um agriculture i would say is a very very interesting one i mean it's interesting if we look at the the problems that you know major agricultural actors have suffered in the south of england in the last couple of years you know england regularly now has drought 
And, you know, agriculture was left out of the debate because they chose to be outside of that debate. They didn't want to be included in the climate debate because they felt they, they could only lose. In the same way as, as the, the, the climate industry in Ireland has sort of sought to duck and weave when it comes to a climate debate. You know what I mean? To avoid duck, dodge, and you know, to avoid coming under pressure to make any commitments, etc. Um, whereas you now have a major problem in the south of England where climate or, or agriculture is not at the table where water resources are under significant pressure in the UK, very significant pressure. And, you know, so water uh, companies um, and the, the off watts and everybody else really are not considering agriculture. And agriculture is going to be a loser by not having taken part in it. It's a very simple example. You know, that, that in, in, in a time of drought, agriculture is not going to be at the table, is not going to be prioritized in terms of, of their, their uh, uh, survival, if you like, in terms of certain types of agriculture, particularly. So there's that risk, you know, as we start to see, and I don't think we're going to be all that terribly far behind the United Kingdom in terms of, of now our, the risks might be slightly different, but, you know, agriculture might want to make sure that they're, you know, seen to be a responsible actor and that, you know, if, if I were, Representing the agricultural lobby, I think I want to make sure that we were we were being listened to, um, as opposed to being a difficult actor, because there, there are very very real risks there. Um, the intergenerational equity question is actually is, is is a very very interesting one, and and actually, you know, lawyers are like like you know kind of handymen. You know, um, we we have a limited set of tools. And what we do is we reach into the toolbox. When a new problem comes along, we reach into the toolbox and we see which of these tools might work for this problem. You know, our training, because we use precedent all the time, is almost never whatever you do, invent anything new. You know what I mean? It's almost sort of, you know, to have the, the, the creativity and innovation beaten out of you, you know, from a young age on your way through law school uh, and never get above yourself and try a new idea. So, you know, lawyers always have to go back to, is there a precedent? Is there something that's been used before? And actually, for intergenerational equity, we have a very, very good model. And that's why intergenerational equity as a, as a principle, as an ambition, has found its way into all of the treaties going back for 30 more years, into the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Biodiversity the Convention on Biodiversity and many, many other agreements. Because if you think about it, you, you know, uh, Intergenerational equity is really very, very similar to the, the bequeathing of property by means of a will, right? You know, when you have an estate and that estate becomes subject to a will. It was a, um, a, a lady, uh, a, a very famous professor in uh, Georgetown University in Washington called Edith Brown Weiss. And Edith Brown Weiss, on a sabbatical year, got a scholarship to go off to, Japan, to the United Nations University in Japan. And she wrote a book in about 1988 called In Fairness to Future Generations. And sometimes one little bit small book can have an absolutely enormous uh, impact. And what she wrote was she said that when we look at, at you know, dividing property between generations, we use the concept of equity, the common law concept of equity. And we use it very, very successfully. So to give you an example, if let's say, you know, um, I, I died tomorrow and my very considerable estate was left to my wife, you know, and uh, a very standard uh, uh, will would say to my wife for her life and the remainder to be divided amongst my two sons equal. That would be a very, very standard uh, arrangement to have in a will. Very, very, very standard. So to your partner or wife for her life um, uh, and then your partner for their life and then the uh, estate, the remainder to be divided equally amongst whatever children. But let's just say that my wife didn't miss me as much as I would have hoped. And she took to sort of hanging around with young tennis coaches and going to Las Vegas and, you know, sort of was, was chewing her way through the estate very, very, very rapidly, right? Then somebody might object on behalf of my young children, you know, a sister or, you know, some other relation of mine might object. And they can go to the court and ask that the court limit what she does. And they would ask that she limit what she does uh, what she spends on the basis of equity. So the court would look at what her lifestyle was, what standard of living she was accustomed to, what the average industrial wage is, or, or whatever. They can pick any number of parameters. What the, what the estate can earn, you know, if there's any income, dividends on shares or income rental on rental properties or whatever else. And then they would, they would say, okay, 
you know, you as the widow are entitled to this amount per year. So that this other amount goes back into the estate as invested. And they would also consider what does it cost to educate two children up to the age of 21? allowing for maybe university education, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they would divide it on the basis of equity. It's that simple. We have a very, very deep well of jurisprudence as to how that works and how it works when situations change and how it works when, when you know, uh, because let's say the court would arrive at an arrangement, so much per year for my wife, for my widow, and then, you know, so much to go back into the, into the estate so that my children would have enough for their education, their university, be able to start and set them up in a profession or a deposit in a house. But if the market changed and my shares were earning much less money or worth less, the court can easily revisit that and tell my wife, I'm sorry, your income is now going to have to be halved because the, the uh, return on the estate is halved. This, we understand this. We know this very, very, very well. And so we talk about an interplanetary trust because that is trust law. It's a trust arrangement. And uh, it's surprisingly well established. It's just that states don't have the, the haven't really, um, the mechanics are no problem. It's the commitment. It's the, it's the, it's the, you know, the political ambition. That's the difficulty. But the mechanics of doing that are no problem. At all. That can be done. You know, with a line in, in, in national legislation that can be easily done because we understand what that looks like. Very interesting. <laughs> I, I wish we would talk for longer. Um, Alan, and, and, and that's that call. Thanks, Owen. Thanks, thanks for talking. Yeah, very interesting. I was struck by the, just the complexity of the whole thing. And I suppose looking at the news today, some newspapers anyway had the headlines about how you know, we're running out of time to get to have our emissions by 2030 and all that. I just, I just, you know, sorry to say so, but I do find it hard to be optimistic, you know, watching your presentation to think, can we get all this legal framework in place in time for the action needed? I mean, I just wonder what you think, how close are we to getting a legal framework, an appropriate and adequate legal framework in place to avoid catastrophic climate change? And... How optimistic, I mean, how optimistic are you that we will get that framework in place? Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I think it's perfectly possible. I mean, the uh, yeah, it's e it's easy to be to be to be very pessimistic, and, and you know, it's not hard to understand why anybody would be. But at the same time, I think sometimes we it's possible to forget how much progress has been made, particularly at an international level. And the international level is very, very important because it's a global problem. And you know, there, there's little point really in, in states acting individually. Um, and at the international level, you know, the, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change has created this, not so much an agreement. The agreement itself has very little text in it, even the Kyoto Protocol, even the, the Paris uh, Agreement. But what you have is you have a big structure under that. You know, you have these specialist bodies under the Secretariat of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. You have a whole series of processes. And what's important about that is if the political will is there, you know, there is there's there's tremendous expertise, institutional memory, there's there's there's, there's mechanisms for communication, for gathering research. So there are the machinery is there for you know ambitious states. And at least I have to say the EU has at least been very ambitious. You know, in terms of trying to be a leader in terms of climate, trying to push the, the, the climate ambition of, of the global community forward. And with that leadership, it's very easy for us to, to, to for, for the international community to set down the parameters, the, the, the outline parameters of what just transition means and to agree that. Now, once you have international agreement on that, that becomes really, really important because every state, even, you know, if not bound by international law, are compelled by domestic politics to adopt the key elements of a just transition. Just by having the guidance, it's like most international law is, is, is actually soft law. It doesn't really, you can't force states to do things. States are a big, difficult, powerful actors, and they won't be dragged by the ear like a bold child, you know, into court and told what to do and slapped on the wrist. But when you create a framework, and that framework appears to be workable and reasonable, then, you know, if the British government or the American uh, federal government or, you know, once they start to move forward and, and introduce 
policies. And those policies don't have regard to the basic elements of just transition set down by the UN. That becomes a problem. You know, uh, uh, civil society will go to court. They will ask courts to say, is this uh, legislation adequate? Is it reasonable? They've completely ignored, you know, what is now established international practice, guidance from the UN, et cetera. And it builds and builds and builds and the pressure becomes unbearable. You know, four states, they have to concede. So it is possible, the machinery is there. And this is one of the things I'm always telling students. It's very disappointing we're not moving forward you know, faster and with more ambition because the machinery is there. What we need to have, you know, getting 193 states to do anything is not easy. You know, states are terribly difficult to act. But the machinery is all there and it's been there for 30 years. So it's well established, it's stable, there's expertise, it has respect. Think of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, how significant that body has been, you know, because for, for decades, the, the, the recalcitrant states were fighting about the science. We're trying to obfuscate and create doubt around the science. And so this big machinery was created around the science to ensure that, you know, really there, there was no room for doubt anymore. And frankly, you know, the, the Trump administration looked simply preposterous when they started trying to rubbish and poo-poo the, the, the climate science. So there are mechanisms, there are ways of doing this, and we have the, the machinery to do so. So in that sense, I would say there is some room for optimism. It just takes the push, somebody to move that initiative to say, look, we really have to develop some kind of, you know, at a COP, and it would have to be done through one of these big COP processes so you can get some buy-in, a lot of politicking before you do that, a lot of trading, uh, and then to say, we're going to develop, you know, some kind of an outline key elements or components you know of just transition and how that can be done at the national level that's perfectly possible thanks um, uh colin hi sorry um oliver yeah um sorry um sorry i just got on ca camera there um Sorry, I, 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 I just I couldn't be on camera there for a good bit. I was just finishing up work. Um, no problem, no problem. Um, yeah, so sorry, just uh, actually just maybe you've passed over with Sabrina already. Could I just go back to uh, her, uh, her specifically about the air quality, the EPA air quality monitors. Um, so just look, a quick anecdote. Um, locally here, um, so I'm in Nace in County Kildare and we have um, we have station 83, which I kind of had uh, noticed that big, large towns should each have a station. So about two years ago, I put in about this and I think maybe uh, my agitation had resulted in that air monitor going into the town. But firstly, can you can you hear me? Yeah, yes, we can. Yeah. OK, I'm um, sorry, I didn't mean to knock off the camera again. Um, firstly, um, like the location that it was put, so it was put in a, a, a county council yard, which, although quite central in the town, is in a very leafy area. I mean, there's there's tree, there's very mature trees on th three sides of this yard. Okay, a substantial amount of trees, uh, like nearly a copse actually of trees would be the best way of describing it. So that's the first thing, and um, and. Um, also, there is the citizen science um, air quality monitors around the town, one of which is on the main street. And so those, you, you, the EPA um, monitor inevitably will always be lagging behind the citizen science one on the main street, okay? <coughs> um, the second thing, um, the second point to make is that, um, Last February or March, uh, out of the blue, they hit uh, on, on the air quality. I mean, it was picked up on by local newspapers that NACE for a brief time had the worst air quality in the country. Uh, and indeed, a, a, a medical doctor went out on local radio about this and made a bit of a scene about it. Now, if you had been paying attention and other people, other contributors phoned in or texted in afterwards very close to this yard this council yard where the epa or where yeah where the epa um air quality monitor is 
they just happen. Uh, they just have to be an um, upgrade of footpaths in that area for about a week. So, like there was Kango hammers going all day. There was a, a, a mini dumper and a JCB. Uh, there was a stop go system of traffic going through. So you know, just happened to coincide that week that we had the highest, the worst pollution in Ireland. So, like, obviously, that wasn't reflective of the air quality in the whole town. It was very localised. But yet, that's the national figures that were published. So, just if maybe Sabrina in particular, Sabrina in particular, if you might have any observations on that. We're really putting you on the spot there, Sabrina, for a... a, a it's very specific. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I won't comment too much because I'm not, uh, you know, uh, privy to all the details that you have. Like, uh, I, I, I don't know the station and, and, and the particular events you're mentioning, but um, it does happen even with citizen science. So I'll just tell an anecdote. Um, we had... Um, school participating in a rural area once and I I couldn't get over when I get I got the result uh, it was the highest in the country and it didn't make any sense so I asked the teacher to to explain you know where, where is the tube located etc and uh, but in the end it just perspired they had a, a temporary uh, diesel powered uh, electricity unit just beside the tube and this had nothing to do with traffic um but there was local pollution for a good while so um these things can happen you know when it comes to the epa when there is something unusual like this uh, i know they do look at uh, anything that is unusual with their data before so they publish it you're right but then when they publish the uh, official data they would correct anything strange which, which might be um what you're saying you know works uh, something unusual or which might be just a monitoring station not working properly. That happens as well. <laughs> they're, they're not yeah. foolproof. So yeah. um, I, I would expect that they, they had a closer look and they found that the data was probably not, as you say, reflective of air quality in NACE at the time. And probably uh, corrected that data, but I can't, you know, I can't know for sure. Okay, but so uh, yeah, no, sorry again. I don't. But so if I went back and looked at that data now from February or March, like I should expect it to be what uh, rounded down somewhat. Is that, is that what you think? I yeah, they normally like remove any data that is not uh, you know okay. to be to be trusted now. But I would do if I were you, you can have a look yourself. But I would I would email them. I would email them and ask the question. Uh, ask them for you know the the it's it's your right to to receive the uh, the information back and understand what's taken into account and why and I would I would do the same with your first question, you know why did they choose that location? Yeah. Uh, there there can be many different reasons. I'm not going to go into the details. But, um, okay. you, you know it's a fair question to ask. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, look. Well, thanks. That's really very useful. Now, if I can actually contact them over that. Okay. Thank sure. you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, Colin, and and thanks, Sabrina, for the answer too. Um, and okay, I I appreciate you and on, on Colin's behalf, I think answering a, a local question like that as, as well as you did, and I'm sure um, other people on the call would have um, you know similar local questions. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll I'll draw the, the event to a close um, yeah. if that is okay with everybody. But I I do want to thank uh, Sabrina and, and Owen for staying on. <laughs> about half an hour longer than 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 you had agreed initially um and i i i think that there is still connections be, between the, the the two presentations um I, I think both of them i think the interest in uh the clean air together uh initiative shows the the interest that people have um in uh first of all an, an environment uh, but then also understanding that there's there's social aspects to to environmental issues and how how it affects them. And I think it's it's the same really. Uh, if I could take that for, from from you know some of the final things you were saying, Owen, uh, about you know the, the interest that people will have uh, in the just transition issue uh, from a legal perspective going forward, um, that you know they they, they will want uh, they will want justice. 
um, and in, in the same way that, that, that people want to know about their, their environment around them with, um, with the clean air together. Um, but thank you both really very much for, for coming tonight. Um, and I'm sure certainly I look forward to you receiving my clean air together tube um, and me getting a, a sense of what uh, the air quality is around me, Sabrina, um, and uh, Owen uh, very definitely would like to get in touch and, and maintain contact on, on the issue of just transition. Thank you, Oliver, and apologies again for mistaking the brief, but thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much for having us, and Thanks good everyone. night, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks. Take care.